Hello, everybody, and welcome to uh, this week's lecture. So last week, if you recall, what we were looking at was um, how to give criteria, how to test. Well, actually, let's go back a little bit further. So remember that we had our two types of Lie algebra, I guess. On one side, we had things which were semi-simple. They were the ones that were, well, as we'll see later, some where you can't break into pieces. They don't have ideals. And then you had uh, nilpotent or more generally solvable, and they had ideals. So they were things that you could somehow take quotients of and form quotiently algebras and so on. You could break them up somewhat, whereas semi-simple were in the opposite. They were more rigid, I guess. Um, that was fine. That was this general theoretical definition of these things. But in, in the real world, in practice, when you're looking at uh, examples, one needs uh, some tricks or some conditions, some equivalent conditions that are easier to verify in order to test an example if you found it in the wild, so as to speak, to, um, to check whether it's solvable or nilpotent or um, simple or semi-simple. So last week we were looking at testing criteria for, for semi-simplicity. Now we're going to look at solvability, okay? And it turns out that solvability is quite related to traces. And this is what's called Cartan's criteria, Cartan's first criteria, Cartan's second, uh, which we do in the next lecture actually deals with semi-simple. So now in this lecture, we're going to restrict to the complex numbers and that's going to become more and more common as we go on. Because as I said, look, working, doing Lie theory over different fields uh, becomes very, very, very different um, theories somehow. Um, so really in this, this is an Annie first course, it's going to be the complex numbers or, um, or the, the setting that you explore because that's the one where everything is best behaved, where everything is the most beautiful. Um, specifically, why we're looking for the complex numbers here is Jordan decomposition. Um, so we're not going to prove this now. Uh, we're going to do this because it arises again when you're, we're classifying some simple Lie algebras. Um, I'm just going to state it and we'll prove it in, well, in lecture two. Um, if you want to see immediately where it comes from, just think back to your first year linear algebra, and there you would have uh, dealt with the Jordan normal form or the Jordan canonical form. You remember where it's, uh, maybe if I can draw here for one second. Uh, if we have a matrix, you can always find a basis so that you've got um, lambdas on the, the diagonal. So eigenvalue, you've got some of our eigen and so on, lambda r, r is the rank. And then up here, you've got ones. Ones and then zeros and then zeros. Okay, this was the Jordan normal form. And then from this Jordan normal form, you can immediately decompose your matrix into a, a diagonal part here just the direct sum, or sorry, the sum of these two matrices, the diagonal here with lambdas, and then the normal is going to be the strictly upper triangular, the N, the, uh, the nilpotent part is going to be the strictly upper triangular. And as we know, if something strictly upper triangular matrices are nilpotent, we know that at this stage, um, it, I mean, well, we know that it's very easy to, to prove just by matrix multiplication. Um, and, and that is really the decomposition. So this result here that I'm giving is a theorem is a consequence of the Jordan normal form, but we'll discuss this a little bit more, more detail. Um, and you also see, I guess, hopefully that the diagonalizable part and the nilpotent, uh, they will commute with each other, just because these things here will commute with each other. And this is called the Jordan decomposition. So maybe less a theorem and more just a corollary of uh, the Jordan normal form, but uh, we'll, Come into it a little bit more in the following lectures. So, um, what's a corollary of the, the decomposition? Again, we won't prove this, we'll prove it later on. Uh, you can take Jordan decomposition of any element. There will exist a polynomial. So, just some polynomial, a polynomial, and polynomial ring with one variable, such that when you operate on, on X, on, on this element here, 
by P, then you get out D. So polynomial works out in such a way that the N is somehow cancelled out and you arrive at D. So there exists such a polynomial. Moreover, if we take any basis, fix any basis of V with respect to which D is diagonalizable, uh, then let D denote the linear map uh, whose matrix with respect to this choice of basis is the complex conjugate of the matrix of D. Okay, so we're just going to take the transpose and looking at the, and take the complex conjugate of all the entries. That will just be the, the diagonal entries because transpose the diagonal doesn't do anything on the diagonal, obviously. And it turns out that if you look at this, there will be another polynomial such that Q of X is equal to T bar, equal to this uh, complex conjugate. Complex transpose, sorry. Okay, so that's that's something that will that's the the consequence. Uh, that's a consequence of the Jordan decomposition that we're going to use later on in the proofs. Okay, so that's just that's just some linear algebra that we need. Let's just set it up at the start. And of course, the Jordan normal form works. We that's why we assume we're working over the complex numbers because that's what we need in order to prove the Jordan normal form over the reals. It's a bit trickier. But um, yeah, that's the linear algebra that we need and we're going to use as we go on, and that's why we're restricted to C. Okay, so let's get back to trying to find some sort of a criteria for a Lie algebra to be solved. Okay, so let X be a vector space, and let L be some Lie subalgebra of the general linear group, all of the linear endomorphisms of V together with uh, the commutator bracket as the lead bracket. And some, some yeah, so a concretely algebra realized inside the endomorphism ring of the vector space. A complex vector space in this case, because we're dealing over C because we want to use the Jordan normal form. So we claim that solvability of L can be seen from the trace of, of GL. Remember last week when we were looking at, at semi-simplicity or semi-simplicity, uh, what we had, oh, the criteria was given in terms of um, bilinear forms to be associated to a representation. Here, we're going to be using traces. Again, we know, of course, that uh, any of these bilinear forms were constructed, the ones we were using were constructed from a representation uh, composed with the trace. So again, the trace is appearing here. So it's not so surprising. However, let's to, to see why it does specifically in this case to get more of an idea of why it should appear. Try to sit down and work out the following exercise on your own. It's a good way to revise on what we had done in the previous lectures. It says is with the, the, the setup that we have here, uh, we'd like to use Lee's theorem to show that there exists a basis of V basis of the vector space V such that uh, the first element in the derived series, the central are the central series, it's the same thing, can be written as strictly upper triangular matrices. Okay. Just a basic use of, of Lee's, Lee's theorem. Um, then, well, and I guess that the other fact that you have to remember, I'll give you the hint, is that remember something is solvable if and only if this guy is nilpotent. Okay, so this is nilpotent, then you can use Lee's theorem, which deals, okay, if I'm giving you too much of a hint. And then from this, uh, the, last, the last line then is obvious. Basically, if it can be written as upper triangular matrices, a strictly upper triangular matrices, this Y, then when we multiply by any X, it's again going to be strictly upper triangular. And, uh, of course, if it's got nothing on the uh, the diagonal, then the trace is going to be zero. Okay, so that that gives you a hint as to why traces are appearing here for solving. Okay, so from this we get an idea where um, we get some motivation for why one would think that traces could have something to do with solvability. All right, so let's let's prove now our first concrete results proposition. So let V be a complex vector space, 
and let L be at least subalgebra of the general linear algebra of V. Okay. Then what we claim is that if the trace of XY for any two X and Y in L, then L is solid. So this is sort of going in the other direction. Not completely precisely, but morally, at least it's going in the other direction. Before we saw solvability implied vanishing of traces. Now we're saying that vanishing of traces implies solvability, which is not obvious, which is not, I said, uh, as, as easy to motivate, so we're just going to prove it. So the proof is, uh, is a little bit long, so uh, try, to, try to keep your concentration. So we, will sh we shall show that every X inside it in uh, L, the Lee bracket of L and L, the first term in the derived series, is a nilpotent linear map. Now, if it is a nilpotent linear map, then it will follow from Engel's theorem that every element of the bracket of L on L can be written as a strictly upper triangular matrix. And hence, L bracket L is a nilpotently algebra. And from this, we can conclude that L is solvable. Okay, because remember, we, we showed in the previous week's lecture, I guess, that, or maybe the week before, that a Lie algebra is solvable if and only if the first term in the row series is nilpotent. Okay, so if we prove nilpotency of, of this guy, then we can conclude that L itself is solvable. Okay, so that's that's what we're going to do. We're going to we're going to show that every X inside here is a nilpotent linear map. Because as we saw. Uh, if that were the case, then Engel's theorem allows us to write every element of the bracket, the bracket of LL, as a strictly upper triangular matrix, and hence bracket of LL is going to be nilpotent, allowing us to conclude solvability. So this is our this is our goal. This is what we're supposed to do. Um, so we're going to use the Jordan decomposition because we're working over C, working over the complex numbers. I hope. Yep, yeah, it's a complex vector space. So let X be an element of the Lie bracket of L and L, and let it have Jordan decomposition, uh, X is equal to D plus N. Remember, our Lie algebra is by assumption contained inside in a general linear group of a concrete vector space. So inside in some matrices with respect to a choice of basis. Um, that means that we can use Jordan decomposition. So we take this, this element X, we decompose it into D and N, where as usual, D is diagonalizable, N is nilpotent, and D and N commute. Now, we're going to fix a basis of, of V in which D is diagonal and N is strictly upper triangular. Okay. Um, which, of course, we can do. Now, since our aim is to show that D is equal to zero, because remember, let, let's just go back for one second. We want to show that it's nilpotent. So we follow from this. If this part here is zero, then we'd just be left with the nilpotent part and we'll be done. So what we're trying to do is to show that D is equal to zero. But what's, what's D? I mean, with respect to this choice of basis, it's just going to be a diagonal matrix with a series of constants down the diagonal, uh, which we call, which we denote by lambda. Now, if we were to take the sum of the lambdas and that was zero, then that wouldn't be enough because it's possible that they could be positive and negative and they could cancel each other out. But if we multiply each lambda by its complex conjugate, then what we get, this number here, this is going to be real and moreover positive for every uh, i, for i is equal to one to the n. And if these things are real and positive, the only way that they can add up to something which is zero is if they themselves are all zero, that L R sub I uh, complex conjugate of L sub I is uh, that, yeah, that this, this is uh, zero for all I, which is to say that the diagonal disappears, which is to say that X is equal to N, which is to say that X is nilpotent and we're done. So we've reduced now, we've reduced it down to proving this identity here. 
Okay. So if you you can for a moment you can we can kind of forget all of the other parts that happened now and realize that we focus just on this identity here, proving this identity um, is enough. So to do this, we're going to consider the uh, the complex conjugate, the complex transpose, sorry, of the, of the matrix D. So it's diagonal, and the transpose is going to be the matrix with diagonal entries, a uh, complex conjugate of I, for I is equal to one to the N. Okay, that's, that's clear. And simple computation, just direct computation, uh, matrix computation, shows that if we multiply X, remember X, which is split up into D plus N, if we multiply X by D bar, then, uh, and we take the trace, we're just looking now at the diagonal. So we take the sum of all of the diagonal entries, they would be of the form Li and L uh, bar I. It's just saying basically that the, the nilpotent part doesn't have any, doesn't do anything, doesn't contribute anything to the diagonals in this with respect to the multiplication of the two of these. And when we take the trace, this is what we get. No, um, as X is contained inside the Lie bracket of L and L, that means that it's going to be, by, by assumption, it's a linear combination of elements of, of this form. Because that's precisely what this is. It's a linear combination of all elements of this form for X, for Y and Z contained inside the Lie algebra L. Thus, uh, it suffices if we could show, this is stronger than what we need, but if we could show that this was the case, well, I guess it's not actually, this is, this is precisely what we need to show. It's not stronger. Um, if we could show that this was zero, then we have it for everything, because then we would have, for a general element, it would just be a sum of zeros, which is, of course, again, zero. So, so this is what we want to show. Uh, but this, in turn, is equivalent to showing uh, this. So we used this identity before, that if you've got a trace, taking a trace in a commutator bracket, then you can actually flip it around. This is just an elementary computation, a one-line calculation in terms of the, um, the commutator bracket here. That's, that's all this is, that the Lie bracket is just the commutator. So there's, there's nothing really going on here. Just using the fact that we can commute things inside a trace. Um, however, by our hypothesis, so sorry, thus by our hypothesis, uh, it suffices to show that the commutator of D and Y is contained inside an L. Okay, so let, let's just go back, just to recall, let's go back to the statement, the, the hypothesis itself. So we're claiming, we're, we're saying, we're trying to prove that if the trace of X and Y is equal to zero for any two elements, then the uh, Lie algebra itself will, will be solvable. Um, here, this is an element of L, and you might think, okay, well, this is an element of L, and this is our hypothesis, therefore we're done. But it's not quite true. The trick here is that, or the, the, the mistake to avoid here is that this uh, commutator here, D is not necessarily contained inside in L. Hence, the commutator is not necessarily contained inside in L. Remember, we took an element that was X, we decomposed it into its diagonal and nilpotent part. They're not guaranteed to be in there, and neither is then the, the complex transpose. So, so this, this guy here may not actually be inside in our Lie algebra L. It could live outside. So, but if we could show that it does live inside, then we can use the fact that the product of any two elements of our Lie algebra, that its trace is equal to zero. Okay. Um, so that's, that's what it reduces down to is showing, is showing this inclusion here. Or in other words, this is just the adjoint. You see the adjoint of, of D bar on, on Y. Remember the, the adjoint makes sense. This is the adjoint of the larger Lie algebra, GL of V. Makes perfect sense. Such that this D bar maps L into L. So we're trying to show. Um, and to do this, we're going to use uh, Jordan decomposition again. And in particular, we're going to use those, uh, that information that we gave, the corollary that we proved, 
sorry, that we didn't prove the corollary that we stated um, about the existence of polynomials acting on the, the Jordan decomposition. So what you should check now is that uh, you want to check this identity, not that this identity is true because that's trivial because the adjoint operator is a linear operator. So we know that this is true, but instead we're looking at this as a linear operator. So if it, as a linear operator on a complex vector space, it admits a Jordan decomposition. And the claim of this is that the Jordan decomposition of this element here is actually the given by uh, the Jordan decomposition of X itself in this simple way, sort of nicest way you would imagine. So you should go have a look at this and check that this identity is actually true. Um, no, assuming that this exercise is true and recalling the existence of the polynomial, we can find a polynomial Q such that Q operating on this, the, the, the general element, is actually going to be equal to the diagonal part. That this polynomial somehow manages to get rid of the nilpotent part. So such a thing exists. We know it exists in general. So in particular, it, it, it works for this example that we have here. So we take Q, we take the special polynomial, let it act on the, the joint operator of X. Then it's going to be equal to, to this the complex conjugate, the complex transpose, sorry. Of, of the adjoint of D, as it should. And this, if you think about it, is actually just equal to the adjoint of T, T bar. Now, we know that add X maps L into itself because X is an element of the Lie algebra. And it's, it's a least subalgebra of a larger algebra. So in particular, it's going to be closed under taking the Lie bracket of any two elements. So that means that X maps L into itself. But that would mean that x squared mapped L into itself, x cubed mapped L into itself, any multiple of x cubed, or any multiple of x to the four, the sum of two elements would map it into itself, and so on and so on. So basically, any polynomial in add x is going to map L into itself. And hence, because we know that uh, this polynomial is equal to this operator here, we know that add x actually maps L into itself. And hence we're done. Okay. If you go back, so, so this, this means that uh, going back up to this equation here, we know that d bar maps any element of L into L itself. So we now know that this element here is contained inside an L. So now we've got an element in L, an element of L. We've taken their product and we calculate the trace. The assumption of the, the hypothesis of the the proposition was that such traces of such products are always zero. And since, since they're zero, then we know that this is zero. Um, which means that this element is zero because any such element, any element X can be written in terms of uh, products. And then that gives us that, that this is zero, which go back to the slide before, this is zero, which means uh, ultimately that our element X is going to be nilpotent. Okay. So long line of arguments to go back. And then finally, if we know that every element is, is nilpotent uh, linear map, then we've got the general abstract form uh, reasoning here that allows us to construct, to allows us to conclude that it's solvable. Okay, so a long proof, try to go back over it yourselves, make sure that you understand every step. And the more times you go over it, the more it will make sense. Mm. But you see that it's not, um, it, it's certainly not an obvious statement. So this, this is a powerful result. We've taken a lot of linear algebra uh, and applied it onto here, as well as uh, general results like Engels and Lee's theorem. Uh, this result. So there's, there's a lot, there's a lot in it. It's quite a powerful result. Uh, now, so this does not give us a characterization. Uh, we'd like an if and only if statement. This says that if, if, if the trace of the product of any two elements of a Lie algebra that's concretely represented satisfy is, is always zero, then it's solvable. But this is, this is still not, this is a not characterization. We'd like uh, an if and only if statement 
for any Lie algebra. However, as you might have guessed, this uh, specific result is actually what we're going to use to prove the more general result. Uh, now, from this, we're going to introduce a new object, the killing form, a very special uh, bilinear form in uh, study of Lie algebras. What is it? Well, remember that we, we saw if we have any representation, we can then form uh, a bilinear form from this using the trace. And the killing form is just going to be the bilinear form associated to the adjoint representation. Uh, here. Okay. In fact, if you check, you should check. It's not so difficult. You'll see that, uh, well, we know that, that every, every such form is going to be symmetric. The L invariance, you should, you should check. Um, but this, this form that's constructed from the adjoint representation is, is, is L invariant in addition to being symmetric. Uh, and what is it concretely? Well, let's just remember the general definition of the bilinear form associated to a representation and then write it down for the adjoint case. It's going to take an X and a Y, two elements, it takes the representation of X, add X, it takes the representation of Y, add Y, takes their product, composition inside in the GL, frac GL, Gothic GL of, of the Lie algebra L, take the product in there, composition, and then take the trace of this operator. That's, that's the killing form. And we denote it by kappa. Or if we want to really specify the Lie algebra we're working with, sometimes we denote it by kappa sub L. This becomes useful when we're dealing with two different Lie algebras or a subalgebra of the Lie algebra, for example. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to produce an if and only if statement about solvability of a Lie algebra, of a general Lie algebra, in terms of this killing form. So a uh, Lie algebra L is solvable if and only if the killing form of L and the Lie bracket of L and L, the first term in the central series, the derived series, if that's equal to zero. So anytime we take an element, I take the, the killing form of an element X in L and an element in, in the Lie bracket of L, L, and this is zero, that's enough. Uh, for your Lie algebra to be solvable, and moreover, if your Lie algebra is solvable, this is always, this always holds. So this is definitely a characterization. Works for a general Lie algebra, and it's an if and only if statement. So what we've got to do is we have, we have to, to prove it. So uh, let's start off in this direction, okay? Going from here to here. So assuming this is true, and then proving solvability from it. Um, so let's just assume this. And now consider the adjoint map, the linear map that goes from L into the general linear group of L using the adjoint. And let's look at the image add of L, okay, that lives inside here. So remember that not every Lie algebra that we're considering is auto automatically a concrete Lie algebra and automatically um, lives inside in the general linear group with some vector space. But we can always map a Lie algebra in there. It may not be injective, but we'll get an image inside there. So it's, you know, it's a big step towards yeah, concrete uh, realization. Uh, um, this again is a Lie algebra because this uh, a joint is a Lie algebra map. And what we're going to do is try to prove that this is solvable and then work back from there. This is not isomorphic to the original Lie algebra, but there's enough information there that if we can prove this is solvable, then this should be solvable, as, as we will see. So let's, let's prove, let's look at this identity here. Look at this identity. So for three elements, X, Y, and Z contained in the Lie algebra L, we have, uh, we can consider the trace of the adjoint of X and the commutator bracket of theirs. Okay, so this is just the commutator bracket inside in GL of N the Lie bracket in GL of N, which is to say the commutator bracket. And then we, that's a Lie alt, that's a, sorry, a linear operator, so we can compose it with this linear operator. Now, if you, you should now check this identity, we're actually saying that this commutator is equal to, is equal to this. 
And that's just an exercise in terms of the Jacobi identity, but we've already proved it because we, we wanted to prove that add was a, a Lie algebra map. So this is precisely saying that it's a Lie algebra map. But again, just if you want to remember where it concretely came from, it was the, the Jacobi identity. So now, uh, but what, what is this? Well, sorry, that shouldn't be a comma, that should be a composition. These are composition of linear operators, sorry about that. Um, this is just the, the killing form, the killing form of X and the Lie bracket of Y and Z, okay? This is the, the representation of Y of Z, the representation of X, and this is how the killing form is, is defined. Here it is a comma, okay? And this, this is equal to zero because of our assumption up here, okay? So, so what we're really doing is we're taking our assumption and we're using it, we've, we've used it, we have used it to show that this quantity here is equal to zero. Okay, but this is saying that the conditions of the, the previous proposition, which is to say the proposition where we gave a sufficient criteria for a subalgebra of the general linear algebra of a vector space to be solvable. We basically asked, we, we said that if we could take the trace of, of these two elements here, then uh, if, if we could take the, take the product of any two elements inside there, let, let's, let's go back, let's go back, it's probably easier. Okay, just as you recall, Lie algebra that lives inside in GL, the general linear algebra of a vector space, if the trace of the product of two elements is zero for all elements in there, then early algebra is solved. That's what we proved, okay? Now, let's go here. Um, now we see, so it's, it's not quite what we had before, okay? This element is in, this element here lives inside in uh, add of L. This element lives inside in add of L. We've shown that the trace of these is equal to zero, but, uh, what the result we had before needed that it was for all elements in, inside here. But here we've, we've kind of got a restriction on the second one. It's something that's contained inside in the first term of the derived series of Ad of L. However, um, that means if you think about it for a second, well, we haven't shown that Ad L is solvable we have shown that this guy is solvable, okay? Because every, every element in, inside here, that this should be in the first entry, but every, every element of this form inside here is just going to be some linear combination of these elements. So if these are all zero, then anything inside here, yeah, is, is going to be zero. So, so we've, this, this not just being a straight add y, this being a commutator, means that we haven't proved that this is solvable, we've proved that this is solvable. But if you remember back to the definition of solvability, this is actually enough. Because it's just gone one term on, we've proved solvability of something one term on in, in the, the, the series. But that will terminate if and only if the, the series of this, because this is the first term, this is the second term. So if when we continue on the, the second term of the series of this guy is the same as this and so on, you, you remember. So, so proving that this is solvable implies that this is solvable. So actually it doesn't matter that this is here. So now we know that add is solvable, okay? How do we go from add? Remember, it's, the joint is not necessarily an injective map. It can have a kernel. So how do we know, how do we take solvability of add of L and from it conclude solvability of L? Well, let's see what the kernel of this map is, the thing that, the, the obstruction to it being injective. So take add that goes from L to add of L. What is this? Well, it's going to be all of those elements in X, which are killed by the adjoint. Representation, okay. So something, a, a linear map is zero if it kills every map. Okay, so it kills every element Y inside an L, which is precisely what's happening here. 
So X has been brought, if X is in the kernel, then X has been brought to a linear map that kills everything, basically the zero map. But what's, what's this quantity here? Well, we know that it's just this by definition. So this is the same as saying, we're looking for all of those elements X, such that their Lie bracket with, with Y is equal to zero. But that's precisely the definition of the center. So the, the kernel, I think we may have already discussed this before, but okay, it's good to remind ourselves. The kernel of the adjoint map going from L into the adjoint of L is actually the, the center. But the center is abelian. Clearly it's abelian. And we remember that everything which is that an abelian ideal is automatically so. Hence, we've shown that this is solvable and this is solvable. But if you recall back, one of the previous lectures, when we quotient a Lie algebra by a solvable ideal and we get something that's solvable, that can only happen if the original guy itself, if the original L was solvable. Okay, we had like this kind of two out of three, it works quite, um, quite, quite well. Uh, in many situations where we were taking quotients, if two out of the three were solvable, then the third was solvable. So here we've we've just shown that we've we've shown in the previous slide that this is solvable. Know here that this is solvable. Um, hence, L must be solvable. So great. We've what we've done is we've taken. So to summarize, what we've done is we've taken our Lie algebra L embedded it into a uh, concrete Lie algebra, the general linear Lie algebra of the vector space, shown then from our previous result about concrete Lie algebras that this is solvable. And then by realizing, by actually figuring out what the kernel of the adjoint looks like, which is to say it's the center, we're then able to show that the Lie algebra itself was solvable. So this is how we use the, this, concrete, this concrete criteria for solvability to prove a general criteria for something. Okay, great. So now put, remember that the statement here is an if and only if. So we've shown that this is sufficient to determine that your Lie algebra is solvable. Now we like to go in the other way to show that if this doesn't work, then it can't be solvable, or equivalently that if this is solvable, then this always works. So uh, let's assume that L is solvable and, and try to prove this result about the killing form. Now, in that case, okay, this is solvable, L by assumption. Again, the center is always solvable. And this is just the identity that we, we proved above. That would mean that add L is solvable, okay, since Z and L are. Uh, it now follows from the exercise. You remember the exercise that we produced at the, the start of the lecture that gave us some motivation for why traces, uh, vanishing of traces would occur when uh, Lie algebra is solvable. So we're not going to use that exercise. We're not going to use that exercise. Um, and we're going, we're using the same identity again. So we have zero uh, is, is equal to this trace here. Okay, so sol solvability means that that this is true for for this is concrete for the for add l because add l is solvable. This uh, and it's contained inside in GL of v. This holds, but we know because it's a Lie algebra map that we get this identity here. We that it's equal to this. Just brought together these two things here. Sorry, these brackets shouldn't be there. It's a typo. Um, but what is this? This is just the definition of a killing form. It's the representation of X, the representation of the Lie bracket of Y and Z. It's just what this is. And then we know that this is zero. And that's actually what we're trying to prove. So this holds for any X, any Y and Z. Hence it holds for all L and the Lie bracket of L and L. It's equal to zero. And that's it, that goes in the other direction. So we're done. We've, we've shown that these two things are equivalent. Okay, so that, that's Cartan's criteria for solvability. You can do it in terms of uh, this, this very special bilinear form called the killing form. Okay. 
So that's where we leave uh, the first half of the lecture. What we're going to do in the next half is actually produce, in terms of the killing form again, is produce a criteria for semi-simplicity, another criteria for semi-simplicity. Uh, and that will also allow us to make some statements about semi-simple algebras, but how they decompose into direct sum of simples, as uh, something that we referred to or promised we would show in previous lectures. But that's where we leave it. Okay, thank you for your attention.